Hey there, this is Mike and you're listening to Feeling Twisty. I'm really glad you're here. Back when I was a child and well into my adulthood, I was confused about who was talking to me. <laughs> I was taught to believe that Satan is always out to destroy me and take me off of God's path for my life. It would have been easy if it were only God and Satan. You know, God and Satan are the only voices I hear. And my own input had nothing to do with it. But I was told that sometimes it isn't God nor Satan, but my own self who could be choosing the right or wrong path. That was one of those things that really confused me about my religion. It really gnawed on the back of my brain. Anytime I was faced with a choice, a decision to make, I would think, is it God making me feel uneasy about a choice because he wants me to go a different way? Or is it Satan who knows that I'm on the right path? I'm doing God's will and now Satan's trying to divert me from God's plan. Or is it just my own sinful nature that lacks discernment to know if it's God or Satan? It was all very exhausting, and very confusing. As an adult, I started questioning it more. There was that verse or a couple of verses, 1 John 4, 7 and 8, that we grew up, you know, going to vacation Bible school and we would sing it during the chapel time. For love is of God, and anyone that loveth is born of God, and that God is love. And if God is love, then why would he set this whole thing up so that any of his children could end up with Satan in hell for eternity? What? <laughs> why would a loving father do that to his children? I have five children, and there's absolutely nothing that they could do that would make me want to punish them or exile them. A parent just doesn't do that, not a loving parent. And that's what I was taught God was, a loving father. So why would he ever throw children into the lake of fire? Come on. I have an aunt who I used to think was a little crazy. When I was a child, she was very religious, very conservative, just like the rest of my family. But she began changing as she aged. If I had to guess, I would say she had her awakening or the beginnings of her awakening 20, maybe 25 or 30 years ago. She never really pushed her beliefs on me but she was always happy to wade into a conversation when those around her were talking about spiritual things. One evening, I mentioned to her how I was questioning things, that maybe the way I was taught about the Bible isn't exactly right, but I told her I couldn't get past my fear of the devil and going to hell. I knew something was up with that, that it wasn't exactly right, but what if? What if <laughs> there is a hell? I don't want to go there. She said only one thing to me. She smiled and she quoted Psalm 82, 6. I say you are gods. What? That's in the Bible? And she smiled and nodded at me. I had never heard that verse. No preacher had ever used that verse, that Psalm in a sermon. And they've never mentioned that quote. Jesus quotes that verse in the New Testament. Never heard that in church. So I begin to wonder what else is in the Bible that I wasn't taught, that was overlooked. I didn't really pursue it diligently back then. I was still caught up in this dream, caught up with my circumstances and the facts of the world. No real awakening yet, but the embers were there and they were smoldering. What does that mean, I say you are gods? This episode comes from a request from a listener. 
One of my Aussie friends asked me about Satan or Neville's explanation of Satan in his talk, Perception. I'll read the quote from Perception. He says, Now remember, nothing appears in perception that cannot be duplicated in fancy. If you can perceive your desire, it exists. You cannot perceive an object that does not exist on some level or levels of imagination. Identify your human imagination with God, and because God calls a thing that is not now seen as though it were seen, you can call a state into being by assuming you are in it. And if you believe you've received your desire, you will, for belief will lead the way to its fulfillment. If you look to reason rather than imagination, you are seeing the devil instead of God. The devil is the doubter in you. He questions your belief, saying, If you are the Son of God, then turn the stone into bread. Cast yourself down, and his angels will lift you up. All of these challenges are made by self-doubt. My friend grew up in church like me and probably had similar beliefs about Satan. Neville says that the devil or Satan is doubt. It's a personification of an internal struggle. The word Satan, according to Strong's Concordance, means adversary, accuser. You hear Satan's voice throughout the day, most likely, <laughs> or at least maybe you used to. Those thoughts running through your mind about not having the right training or marketing skills or body type or, well, any of these thoughts of lack, of your inability to fulfill your dreams. That's Satan. It's your own doubt. It's coming from your own state of consciousness. That is your adversary, your accuser. The one telling you you aren't good enough, that you're too old, that you've made too many mistakes, is you. Not the true you, but your mind, your state of mind. Who you are is the I of you, the one experiencing all of these things. When you have a desire and begin to wonder what it would be like to have it, to have its fulfillment, your present state screams at you, I don't have the money for that. I don't even have a high school diploma. How can I be successful? Oh, this new business plan. I don't know anything about digital marketing. <laughs> From your present state, these wonderful things seem impossible. Just dreams. Because the state you're in doesn't contain them. The lack of them causes your desire to have them or attain them. But that state doesn't have the means to fulfill that desire. I really don't believe the Bible is an historical account of mankind, not a physical history, but a spiritual or psychological biography of each one of us. Each character is a state. Even Paul tells us that. In Galatians, he says that the story of Abraham and Sarah is an allegory. Abraham, the father of Islam and Judaism and Christianity, is an allegory. If he is an allegory, then his whole lineage, all of his descendants, are part of the same allegory. All states of consciousness that each one of us go through. Paul says he used to think of Jesus as a man, just like we all do, like I did. But he says he doesn't any longer. He says that Jesus Christ is the power and wisdom of God. And God is within us. Jesus, awakened imagination, tells us in the book of Luke that the kingdom of God is within us. So if God is within us, then is Satan out there somewhere separate from us, separate from God, running around with a pitchfork, trying to devise ways to ruin me? No. Satan is within me too. Oh, I can't believe you just said Satan's inside him. 
Mike's going to hell. Satan is doubt. Satan, being doubt, my own self-doubt, is within me. Never without me. Never out there. The Bible says, or the Bible has the self-existent one, God, I am, say, I kill and I make alive. I wound and I heal. I form the light and I create darkness. I bring prosperity and create disaster. I, the Lord, I, the I am, do all of these things. So there isn't a separate being out there, Satan, creating disaster, causing poverty or sickness or war. God does all these things. And there is no God other than I am. You, me, we are one. The one thing that doesn't change, that is not any state, but the creator and inhabitor of all states, is the self-existent one, the I of you. You have memories of wonderful and traumatic experiences, but you were never those things. You were never those experiences. You aren't those memories now, and you never will be. You can't be. Satan might be whispering to you that you can't transcend those memories or change the course of your life. But there's nothing to fear. Satan is just your own doubt coming from the state you're in. When Jesus rebukes Satan, he says, Get thee behind me, Satan. And of course, I used to think I had to do what Jesus did, and that's the way our church did it verbally rebuking Satan. In the name of Jesus, I cast you out. I bind you up. I rebuke you, Satan, all of that. This isn't something you have to do. Jesus gives us the example. He shows us what to do. He puts doubt, the doubting thoughts, behind him. It says, get thee behind me, but we don't have to do that or say that. It gets behind us, out of our way, when we focus on and give our attention to the state of our wish fulfilled, or when we put our attention on who we really are. And who we really are is love. That's how we describe consciousness, awareness, God, love. And in the light of love, doubt and fear can't stand up. It dissolves. So Jesus is done with doubt, done with the self-accusations, with the temptations, done with the condemnation, done with trying to do things according to the way the world does. And he turns his attention to his goal, to the state of his wish fulfilled. By doing that, putting all of your attention, dwelling in the state of your wish fulfilled, you are automatically rebuking Satan or doubt. You're turning toward and moving into the state of your wish fulfilled. Satan or doubt or is no longer in front of you, no longer part of your view. If it's behind you, it's out of sight. You're no longer giving your attention to the old state, the state that says your dreams are unattainable. Listen, there is nothing that is unattainable. Mark 11, 24 says it plainly. Whatever you ask for in prayer, be believing. That's an ongoing, sustained, continued belief that you have already received it, already have it. You are already it, and you will have it, be it. Prayer isn't what we've thought of as a time of supplication on our knees at an altar or in our prayer closet. You're always praying. The two Greek words that make up prayer mean motion towards and to wish. Where are we moving in and out of our wish fulfilled all the time? In our imagination. So we're always praying. We're always imagining. 
If you really believe your wish is fulfilled, then everything about you would echo that belief. Your thoughts and reactions, your behavior, your outward behavior, all of that would reflect, and it does reflect what you believe. Whether you believe you are this state of poverty or the state of wealth. Even if symptoms seem to persist and Satan or doubt starts saying it's not working, stand firm. Keep your imaginal eyes forward in the feeling of the wish fulfilled. The Bible says to resist the devil and he will flee. And I took that all the wrong ways growing up. Resist the devil. It's a fight. I've got to battle Satan and rebuke him in the name of Jesus. Plead the blood. All that means, that verse, resist the devil and he will flee. All that means is be unmoved, unbothered by the facts of the world unmoved by your thoughts about the facts of the world. Hmm. You remain in that 180 degree contrary position to the old state, the state where those devilish doubts are coming from. Stay in the feeling of the wish fulfilled and Satan, doubt, will flee. It has to. <laughs> There is no action to take against Satan or doubt. It isn't a war that angels and demons are fighting all around us. Although, I admit, that does make for some good movies. <laughs> this is all within you, within consciousness. You. My little Satans are different than your Satans. <laughs> because my state is different than yours. Neville says there are infinite states. And if there are infinite states, then there must be infinite devils that go along with those states. It's just doubt. No creature out to get you. Nothing lurking in the closet waiting for you to fall asleep and suck your energy from you as you dream horrible dreams. Nothing to fight. There is no battle. Stop imagining battles. Stop imagining war. There's nothing at all to get upset about. When you notice the doubts, well, remember that you aren't what those doubts are saying. You aren't the state those doubts are springing from. You, you are the observer, the listener, when you notice the doubts, ask yourself, am I really this? Am I really what these thoughts are telling me I am? Am I really this problem? Is this really a problem? Or am I aware of these feelings? Am I aware of the thoughts of doubt? Am I really this circumstance, this situation? Or am I imagining it? You or God, and not the God that we grew up thinking. You are consciousness, imagination. Who and what you are conscious of being, what you are imagining, is not you. You are the one imagining, but not the things imagined. If it really were you, then you wouldn't be able to change. You'd be fixed in one state all of your life. But think back over your life. Aren't there all kinds of things you've experienced? Fantastic things, maybe some awful things. The one that observed those experiences is the real you. The self-existent one. The one that exists on its own. It has no need for states, for existence. The only one that truly exists. Nothing else exists. Nothing else stands out 
as its own. All else appears to exist separate from the one and seems sometimes agonizingly real. And it is through these imagined filters we call our human selves in this little dream, it is real. Just like things appear solid and real in a dream at night. They seem so very real, don't they? But you wake up and you realize, ah, oh, that was a dream. Or maybe you, maybe you wake up and you think, crap, that was just a dream. <laughs> but it seems so real. That's the same thing with what you call your real life. Objects, people, facts seem so solidly real and unchangeable. But it is still only a dream. None of this exists or stands out on its own, independent of you. My next episode is another listener request. How to find that feeling of the wish fulfilled. I love you. I'm feeling twisty.